All right, we're going. I'm going to call to order the May 24th, 2023 regular meeting of the Hastings School Board at 6.01. Um, Treasurer Davis, could you please take attendance? I sure can. Thank you. Director Zuzik? Present. Director Dressley? Present. Director Tate? Here. Chair Hadeen? Here. Director Davis here. Absent, Director Mom and Director Bison. I'd ask you if you're able to stand, face the flag and remove any headwear and we'll recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion and a second to approve the agenda. So moved, Davis. Second, Zizek. Second, Zizek. Is there any discussion? Um, since I thought of this five minutes ago, I apologize. But I moved to have a brief discussion about um, the survey that we had agreed to do in June for the board and just um, determine the timing. We had agreed to do a self-reflection tape survey in June. And since we haven't talked about it yet and it's almost June, I think we should have a brief discussion just talking about timing and who's doing what. I, I appreciate that. I suppose we don't have a work session until the 14th. I was gonna say it's that as a rule. So is that a motion? Yes, oh, yes I moved to add a brief discussion. <laughs> second topic, Dressley. Procedurally, that would normally be a work session item, given that it we've been kind of run over recently. Um, I think that's fair. I, as long as we don't have any decisions to make tonight, because I don't know if we, one, we're lightly represented, and two, people aren't ready. But um, any further discussion? All right, so the motion on the table is to add a discussion item regarding the board self-evaluation survey. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, that motion carries. Um, I have a item for discussion and I would make a motion to remove the request for future topics from um, the agenda tonight and through the rest of the calendar year. I'll wait for discussion until I hear a second. I second that, Davis. Um, thank you. I'll, as a person making the motion, I'll start the discussion, then we'll see if, it, if anybody wants to weigh in. So we talked about this briefly at our work session. I don't know when it was, a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, the request for future topics was an item that was added in an attempt to resolve concerns about items being brought forward by board members and then not being seen reflected in calendars or not coming to the board table for discussion. Um, I think that era has passed. I think we've the, what I've seen and attempted to do since we paused it for four months is everything that I've become aware of as a topic has been scheduled into a calendar. And my reflection on that agenda item is that it's become fractious. It shows us in a public setting frequently um, because we vote on its inclusion or non-inclusion There's, there demonstrates a, a kind of a conflict because it's rarely a 7-0 or however many O. And I don't think that that's valuable. I do understand, and we heard about, I heard this clearly in the discussion at the work session, that it's valuable in a public space where it's frequently being broadcast that the public hear about what's coming up when. And, and I, I can see a lot of value in that. And it would also be a time that from a like an input perspective, and I can see that fitting in with the future topic, future meetings. We've never used that as much of a discussion piece or a sharing piece. It's just been everybody go look at the link. But I think my intent would be to use that to lay out what's coming up in the future, and then also asking for board members to provide uh, things that they might have heard recently, like since the time that they would have been able to send myself and Superintendent. McDowell an email about a topic for consideration and how to get it in the calendar. 
So I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not closing down that discussion, but I'm looking for a way for us to eliminate that, that vote piece. Um, is there any further discussion? I, I, I'm saying this for clarification. So what I would understand is that there's still going to be a brief discussion about uh, things that are, oh, topics of interest that are coming forth to the board, whether it be at a work session or at a, a regular board meeting, or maybe something that comes up and we might decide as a group, hey, that should go to the policy committee. But the piece that we're not going to do is the voting on topics to see if something's added because that's the part that's been fractious, right? Fractious. Yeah, that is the term I use. I think what it, to be to be clear, and thank you for requesting clarity on the motion. The motion would be to remove the action item of request for future topics, and in turn expand future meetings, which is identified as a topic item, to be future meetings and topics. Okay. And it would be a chance again. The poli our policy and in, in our the practice we've tried to establish. I've tried to establish as chair over the last four months is a, a topic is identified whether in a committee meeting, a work session, or in the board table, and is integrated into our calendar at a time that makes sense for people and when people are available. And and I think we've been successful at that. I think what happens with that though, if it's at a committee meeting or policy, or excuse me, or a work session. The public doesn't know that it's coming up until it hits a board board book item. So when we would get to the future meetings and topics, it wouldn't be a time when we give direction because frequently we're not ready to give direction about where it might go, but it would be a time to say, this is what's on our calendar. So for example, the notes that I have for myself when we get to future topics tonight or meetings is to remind everybody we anticipate a single action item on the 31st of May for superintendent contract. There's some likely a special meeting that's going to be in June. Um, we're anticipating a closed session just to give some heads up of what's coming. And at that time, if something's come recently to a board member's attention, because otherwise I would have received an email saying, oh, hey, I've heard about this thing. We could say, oh, I'm aware of this is on the horizon. Let's make sure we talk about that at the next work session or something. Or it might be, I've heard this from the community, it's not really a board action, but it's just, it's an awareness. We should have this awareness, whatever that might be. And it's an opportunity to share that in a place. So I just, that's my, that's my thoughts on that. But is there any further discussion on the, on the motion on the table? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, which is to um, strike topics for future discussion and revise for, through the end of the calendar year. The next board can decide what they want to do um, and revise future meetings to be future meetings and topics as a standing agenda item. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. We had four in favor, Zuzik, Hedin, Davis, and Tate. And Jessica uh, Dressley, excuse me, is in opposition. Sorry. All right, so we still have one outstanding motion on the table. And we're in discussion for motion to the, for the approval of the agenda with the two amendments that have been made to date. Is there any further discussion on the agenda? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Um, our next item is a motion to uh, approve the minutes from the April 24th special board meeting. These are all in 2023. April 26th. I'm sorry, my screen just keeps scrolling to the bottom. April, I'll just keep my hand far away. April 26th, May 10th, and May 16th. Those agenda items have been, those uh, minutes were included in my understanding is that I know some comments were made about corrections and I think they've been incorporated. Sorry, you missed the 24th as well. Oh, I think I said that while I was touching the screen. Sorry, the 24th, the 26th of April, the 10th and 16th of May. It, excuse me if I wasn't clear. Could I get a motion and a second for their approval? So moved, Dressley. Second, Davis. Thank you. We have a motion and a second on the table. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. 
I want to thank our visitors, both those who are here in person and uh, virtually or attend or watching maybe at some future time. And I and I can sense visitors around the corner. I look forward to uh, to moving to a future topic and hearing more about our visitors who are just tucked around the corner. Um, so with that, thank you for taking the time. We think the value of um, watching government in action is um, it's really important to the heart of our community, and we appreciate you taking the time to do that. With that, I'll turn the microphone over to Superintendent McDowell for announcements and recognition. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go in reverse order. Uh, I'd like to call up Cindy Oppold first. Uh, every year for public uh, to know and or our audience, every year we do employees of the semester for each semester. The six semester or six employees from first semester, six employees from second semester um, are then put back out to the staff to vote on employee of the year. And this year, uh, Cindy Oppold, who is and has been a teacher at both the middle school and the high school in Hastings for many years. And if I understand correctly, has pretty much taught every course that we've <laughs> offered in math um, and has had a, an absolute stellar career with the district, is also retiring. Um, but she has been selected by her peers as the 2022-2023 Employee of the Year. So Cindy Apple. There we go. Thank you for the recognition, you guys. It has meant a lot. I feel very honored. Um, I have enjoyed my 24 years with Hastings Public Schools, and um, I've been involved in a variety of things, and we just, we have such good people that work for our school district that, uh, you know, they inspire you to be a better person and to be a better educator. And uh, we also have just awesome students. Our student body is an involved student body, um, an intelligent student body, and they really um, give their heart and soul to our schools. Thank you. Congratulations. Next, I want to bring up uh, some Kiddos, and before they come up, I'm going to invite Craig Bison to come up. Uh, Craig, as you know, is with the Hastings Rotary, and Rotary sponsors a Student of the Month. And so every uh, semester, we try to acknowledge our Students of the Month, and Craig uh, graciously comes up before you and provides a little information about that and uh, all that goes along with Student of the Month and Rotary. So I'll turn it over to Craig. Awesome. Thank you. Well, you guys might as well come up with me. I'm going to be talking about you. So, um, again, my name is Craig Beisel. I am. Um, I'm not the president of the Rotary Club. I'm the president elect. So I'll be the president next year. And now I just kind of fill in where we're needed. Normally, Abby Myers is the one who <coughs> presents, but she's a little bit under the weather. So, um, thank you for the time for me to share with you um, our quarterly students of the month. Most of you know me. Again, I'm Craig. The Rotary Club is proud to recognize one student each month. We present this award during our meeting the third Thursday of each month throughout the school year. If any of you are ever interested in attending one of these programs, we have an open invitation to you to join us anytime during one of these celebrations. Our students of the month for the first four months of the year were Tyler Wood, and Sarah, Tyler Wood, Sarah Myers, Alyssa Nessigen, and Lindsay Matheson. The other two um, weren't able to be here this evening. Um, to be brief, it, is always, it always amazes me to hear these students share with us their accomplishments, their involvement in the community, the organizations they are a part of, their future plans, etc. Honoring our student of the month at our meeting is always uplifting. Each time we hear about an honoree, we are left with feeling inspired and amazed. And quite frankly, a feeling like underachievers from when we were all in high school. <laughs> the Hastings School District should have a sense of pride and achievement with all the opportunities and extracurricular activities that students can engage in while attending high school. These students are being given opportunities to prepare them for life skills that will assure them future successes as they graduate high school and head out into the real world. Again, thanks for your time and congratulations to Tyler, Sarah, Alyssa, and Lindsay. And uh, they will be open for some questions. If you don't have any questions, um, I'm going to ask a question if you guys don't have any, because I was just, again, floored by our conversation we had prior to this meeting. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead. All right, so I will. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask, and I will say I have I have read the Rotary Student of the Month articles that were in the Hastings Journal, so I'd have that background, but I would appreciate it if you would each 
take a moment and share um, what are some of the key components that you're engaged with, and I recognize your faces from hearing being here previously occasionally, um, and activities that you participated in in the high school and... Um, okay, and well, so I think the Rotary Student of the Month exemplifies service above self. When I think of that, what first comes to mind is my like involvement with Johnny and Friends, which is an organization that brings kids with disabilities to a camp every year and their families and allows them to enjoy it just as anyone else would. So every year I serve there for a week and just help give them the best week that they possibly can. And it has been one of the most rewarding experiences. Other than that, I volunteer with the Red Cross and I do my youth in government and model Uni United Nations. I'm also in dance and lacrosse and a few other activities <laughs> spread throughout. <laughs> Your free time. <laughs> um, Alyssa basically described it. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that the Rotary Club just wants to recognize people who lead things, even when it's, even when there isn't time for those leaders. So, which I think everybody, all the Rotary students of the month have been shown. But other activities that I'm in, I'm in cross country and track and field. I shot, trap, and skeet. Um, I'm part of student council, link crew. I'm an FCA huddle leader. And yeah. I, I learned so many new acronyms. <laughs> there are so many. Um, when we were back here speaking, you guys were talking about getting ready for your senior year, fi some finalizing some projects. Mm -hmm. How many page paper did you guys eat, just hand in that I used? Well, to? for me, it was like a 78 page final portfolio for college lit. And mine was 87 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It's awesome. nice to be done with. <laughs> So yes, thank, thank you so much for your time. We are, we're just, uh, we're very blessed to be able to honor some students of the month and you guys are just doing some awesome things and you have some, you guys have a great future, trust me. If I was half as successful, successful <laughs> as you guys in college, wow, so awesome. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next item is to hear a listening session summary. I don't know if that's coming from Director Davis or Director Zuzik. Um, I guess I'll take it. <clears throat> we can get through it without coughing. Um, so we had two individuals today um, that came to us, uh, both community parents, and they have okayed um, myself or Mark to summarize kind of as one long summary as opposed to each of them what they had to say because uh, they were so comparable to one another. One of them was uh, a thanks to all of us on the board for the work we did toward hiring the superintendent and the work we continue to do in terms of trying to get things done for the kids in the community. And they wanted to make sure that thanks were given to every member of the board for that. Um, another piece was they wanted to express their support for extension of the levy. Um, as some people know, maybe not everyone, there um, is an opportunity to extend the levy um, through a vote of the board. And they each wanted to express their support of expanding that levy for another year, um, stating the strong schools and community um, will protect students and staff and allow us to avoid any types of catastrophic cuts um, in the foreseeable future. And so I wanted to make sure we got that out there. And then finally, um, they asked if there was a budget for landscaping. They'd like to see nicer curb appeal, if you will, in terms of when you come to the schools, um, specifically it's pointing out a couple of things in the middle school and how um, maybe there's local volunteers and such that we might be able to bring in to help us increase the curb appeal, if you will, of the um, existing, of the entrance ways and what you have you to our buildings here in Hastings. And that was it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like that was an accurate summer. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. I'm just um, including this in my board notes. That's my, my most uh, succinct place to include that. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Director Tate. I just wanted to make a clarifying statement so everybody understands the levy when we vote on the levy it's for 10 years yes. so the public understands that um.
Um, okay, and I, I anticipate we'll have a little more discussion about that tonight and lead forward because this is this will be our first opportunity to talk about um, some legislative action that that gives the board a choice. Um, and I think that will be part of what we hear next as we move to reports and discussions. Our first reporter is Superintendent McDowell. Yes, you will. Um, before I get into that, though, I just want to, um, again, shout out to the community. Monday night, um, we had our senior awards oh. and scholarship night. And um, it, again, is amazing. We gave, the, the community gave over 100 scholarships to students. <laughs> and um, there was some battling going back and forth of who was going to add to their scholarship so that we could actually get over the 200000 mark. Uh, and they did that uh, well over the $200,000 uh, mark that was given out uh, this week to uh, seniors, which is just unbelievable. Uh, when you think about it. So I just, I want to make sure we give a shout out to the community and, and that and the support of our kids as they move on to the next chapters in their lives. Um, so it's been busy uh, at the legislature. It's been busy trying to figure out what uh, the bills mean, what all the different components of the bills mean. Um, Monday, two big bills came out of committee. So the K-12 finance bill and the labor bill came out. And as of this morning, the governor signed the, um, the financial packages. So a lot of this stuff is really fresh um, off the press in terms of were there changes, weren't there changes. Um, and so what I'm doing currently is going around to each of the buildings and trying to help everyone understand where does what is happening, what might that mean, and what do we still need to understand because there's a lot of details to be worked out, even though there's a lot of words on paper yet. There's a lot of specifics that haven't happened. So with those two bills, um, the really good news, and I am assuming by tomorrow morning, it will be blasted all over the paper. The, the, again, the concept of the historic amount of money that's been put into K-12 education, which that's a truth. There's, a, there's an absolute huge amount of money that's been put into education with <clears throat> what just happened with the legislature and the governor. Some highlights of that, uh, for next year, 4% on the formula, and the year after that, 2%, and then ongoing an inflationary factor that won't drop below the 2% is what's planned to be there. So that's really great news for all K-12 schools. Um, special education is gonna see cross-subsidy increase of 44% uh, next year, 50% the following year. Uh, we're not quite sure what happens after that, but that's significant, particularly for a district that we have a we have a special education bill between five and six million dollars a year. Our our we take about three million out of that general fund every year to, to meet the cross, so that's huge for us. There's some smaller additional funding pieces for EL, about twenty thousand um, dollars. This student support staff member, about fifty three thousand dollars, and then a library aid. And we're gonna that's one of the things trying to figure out what is meant by a library aid, uh, seventy three thousand dollars. And anybody that's been with the district knows that an average salary for staff benefits sits right around that ninety eight to one hundred thousand dollar mark. So these by no means to get us full people, but they get to get us pieces. And so what's gonna to have to be decided is where do you share this piece of the funding at 20,000, 50,000, 70,000 with those three pieces. Um, so that's the really great news. The, the long and short of it, however, that people still need to keep in mind is that um, it, we've been the last 20 years not getting the rate of inflation towards education. And so while this makes a dent in this, this does not make a district whole. It doesn't make Hastings whole for what hasn't been there the last 20 years. In addition to that, it's awesome we're getting 44%, but there's still 66% of special education that's not being covered, right? So, th so while all of that is great and it's awesome, it, it is money that is going towards the things that we're already eating up through our general fund, uh, for the most part. In addition, there's things like our, our annual roll-up cost just for salaries for everybody in the district is about 1.3 million. So there's an additional cost every year. Yeah, could you explain what roll up means? Yeah, so so in our in in collective bargaining in contract work, uh, in terms of employment, there's usually these these steps and lanes, and so contracts go over a couple of years, and people step. 
from year one of a contract to year two. And so a roll-up cost is what is that automatic cost that's built in. And so if, if you're spending a dollar this year, then the roll-up cost gets added to that dollar. So you're spending that dollar plus whatever the extra cost is that second year. Um, and so for us to roll everybody up in just salaries is a little over a million dollars a year uh, additional. Um, and so, Again, great, great news, but it doesn't it, it doesn't totally fix the problem. And so we end up in a in a spot where then we start looking at what do all the other mandates mean that are coming through. And there's several mandates that we think are a potential to actually cost the district money that we aren't spending currently. So here's a couple examples coming out of that. Um, Moving forward, we're going to have requirements in ethnic studies, in finance classes, and in civics classes in particular areas. Um, and that's all going to be mandated. If we don't have someone currently slated to do that, we're going to have to figure out what portion of an FTE now teaches those courses and where won't that person be teaching? Will you have to add an FTE? Doesn't mean it'll be a full FTE, it just means there's gonna be something probably have to be added in order to pull that off in the system or something else has to go away in order to fill that spot. Um, there will be significant changes uh, in law to K-3 discipline. Uh, it's called non-exclusionary uh, provision, which means that um, in kindergarten through third grade, suspensions are not going to be happening. Uh, that's not just for Hastings, that's for for everyone, it's a non-exclusionary rule. What we know about elementary, um, and for people that work in elementaries, is if students aren't going home, they're staying in the schools, which means we need people to be with those students. And it can't be the people who are supposed to be teaching the classes, and it can't be the paraprofessionals they're supposed to be supporting the classes. So there's there should be an expectation of additional FTE to help figure this out at three elementary schools and pre-K. Um, there's going to be non-exclusionary non disciplinary provisions in fourth grade through 12th grade, not as restrictive, but the school districts are going to have to show that they've used non-exclusionary practices before they get to suspensions. That's all the stuff we've talked about in terms of uh, restorative practices and um, non-suspension type pieces that come into a building and all of that takes people to pull off. We've seen that through the ESSER years, right? So the ESSER dollars that we're losing, we're paying currently for people like college and schools, or not college and schools, uh, community and schools. Um, we're paying for our MTSS people, extra social workers, all that's being paid for right now out of ESSER. And so there's potentially an FTE extra cost that as we've talked about with budgets, the long and short of that is you either have to not do something else and now keep these, or you got to add to your expense. It, it's, and again, it's not just Hastings, but it is what it is. Um, the Family Paid Medical Leave Act is expanding. And so what that means is that what used to be um, eight weeks, nine weeks, is now 20 weeks of available family medical leave. And while there's going to be employee tax and employer tax to help offset the cost of that, when someone's gone an additional 12 weeks, when they used to be gone eight, we still have to provide subs, which means there's an additional potential cost to backfill. So these are, again, some of the things that as we're looking at all the finances of the mandates, that awesome money coming into us is in my mind, and I think in our finance department, all of a sudden it's going, this is eaten up, this is eaten up, this is eaten up. This is, so we gotta be really careful how we do things. Um, the READ Act, uh, people have paid attention to that. Um, there's an expectation that we, employ, we train up and employ a literacy lead for that. So we'll, that'll have to be figured out what does, where does that come out of. Um, in addition, while there are some dollars being put in for professional development, there's a professional development requirement with the READ Act. There's a lot of other provisions that not quite sure exactly what'll, what'll cost um, there. <coughs> Special education services is being expanded to age 22. Currently it goes to 21. We all know that if we're adding 
a year to that. That's going to be time and staff that are going to have to uh, be a part of that comes into that cross subsidy conversation. And then uh, moving forward, the district has to negotiate things like class size ratios, student testing, student to personnel ratios. And while on the front end, that might not seem like it has a cost to it. If you start working your way down that conversation, if we lower class sizes by negotiation, two potential things happen. One, you may run out of space because there's a difference in staffing an elementary school at 20 kids to a classroom and having enough classrooms or 15 kids and not having enough classrooms. So an unintended consequence could be a facilities question moving forward. Otherwise, uh, to get to that level of staffing, it would be adding FTEs into the classroom where now you might have three teachers between two classrooms instead of two. Well, at, at that FTE cost, you can see how that exponentially rises. There will have to be some solutions to these mandates because, again, 4%, 2%, the uh, cross subsidy is not going to take care of all of that. It, it just isn't going to. It won't make the district whole. The nice thing is, over the last three years, we've been right sizing, right? We've been making very conservative decisions about what we spend money on. We've not made some people happy because we've made reductions uh, to certain programs. But what that's put us in a place of is between doing those things and the legislative additions, we're at least in a spot where we're not going, I think we're gonna have to make this gigantic reduction to get us forward. We're still gonna be in that close to level playing field strategically moving forward, which is where we wanted to be. It's, it's exactly what we wanted was to be set up. And that leads us into what Director Davis brought in, which is part of the, um, part of the legislation. It allows school boards to approve one time by resolution a existing operational levy. So that means that the operational levy that we've been talking about at several board meetings now, that we've been planning that would expire if it wasn't re-voted on by the public in November, that is now eligible to be renewed one time with the same parameters that it currently has, which essentially means it can't be approved by you as a board for any more dollars, but it can include the 10 years and it can include the inflationary factor because that's a part of the existing levy. And as we talked um, at a work session last week, that if this went through, our administrative recommendation is that's what the board takes on. It has to happen by June 15th, and there has to be public comment allowed before it, it comes on. So that's something as a board, administratively, we're recommending that, that we keep moving along that line. Tied to that then is what the board got a, the board has received a report on the survey and a report on finances so far. When we look at what the survey told us from the community's perspective, the community was relatively supportive of a operating levy renewal and relatively supportive of adding money to that. That gives the board, I think, some confidence in decision making. We also asked the community what their thoughts were about a technology levy. And the community was supportive, um, almost 70%, according to the survey, about a technology levy. And so that's the other thing that we've talked about at a work session is what does this look like? And that will be our administrative recommendation is the focus for the board leading up to November really is just on that technology levy. Why that's important is um, we can, through a technology levy, utilize those dollars to take care of things that are currently being paid for out of the general fund. And it, by default, frees up dollars in the general fund to do some of the things that even I've talked about earlier here that are gonna be some mandated things that are, you're gonna need to take care of. So by default, it allows us to allocate dollars specifically for what the public Want, says they want, keep our technology up to date. The unintended consequence there is a positive one and that it also helps with that general fund a little bit. And it doesn't put two questions potentially out in November. So that's why that's a recommendation administratively. We feel pretty good about that because the community also said that they, they for the most part, trust what we're doing and how we're doing it. 
Um, we don't currently have a technology levy and the opportunity is now on the table for us to uh, have the board approve um, the existing operational levy. And as long as nothing changes, the board would have the same option for the 2027 operational levy. And you can do these up to two years in advance of the levy. So when we look at how Hastings is laid out with two operating levies instead of one big one, this strategy should help the board in communicating and keeping the public in the know and very strategically um, asking the community to vote only when you really need them to vote to bring in more dollars. And with that, I'll open it up to questions, but that's, uh, that's what I have for legislative updates. Dr. McDowell, as, as we look around at comparable districts, how common is the capital improvement levy or technology levy uh, strategy? How many districts have those uh, in our comparable districts? We typically compare ourselves with um, most of the districts in Dakota County. So there ends up being seven or eight districts that we compare either ourselves to either geographically, um, democra demographically, um, or by other means in terms of just questions like that. We are only one of two of the, of the um, eight that do not have a technology levy currently. Um, the rest of the districts are operating technology levies um, and they, they do it for the reason that I explained. The community really likes to know exactly what they're getting for the money. It's no different than a bond. You really tell people with a bond, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. With a technology levy, you're basically telling them the same thing and the community knows that that's what that money is set aside for. Are there any additional questions at the board table? I know this is the second time that we've heard it, um, but but we have we have reached the end of the legislative session. So the, the range of possible outcomes has been limited now. So this is starting to become drying ink. Does anybody have any further questions? All right, sounds good. Um, we'll move to the next um, report on our building construction fund project update. I believe that will be Director Subert. Thank you. So just a quick reminder that the building construction fund is the account where the money goes that was received from the voter approved bonds and can only be used for school renovations and improvements. So a few updates from last month, um, the high school lighting project was completed. So that's been uh, moved into that top section of complete projects. And then the reallocation to the new projects that were approved at the last board meeting, um, you'll see all of those projects have now been added. So that had additional money going to safety and security improvements, interior locks, and then some new projects for the middle school media center, a Tilden preschool classroom, um, bollards up at the high school student entrance, um, the nature preserve, parking lot and the gymnastics program moving to the middle school gym. There were some additional dollars also allocated for technology improvements. And then related to the listening session question, um, there actually is a grounds and sites improvements project in there um, that is planned for this uh, summer and fall that will do some underground sprinkler work, um, landscaping at the buildings, and then a maintenance strip around each one of the buildings to um, allow for some better maintenance there. And that's all I have unless there's questions. All right, not seeing any questions. I think we can move to the next report. Um, um, May fundraising, is that, Director Subert, is that you as well? Or is that just? For, so typically we don't do much of a report for the is, fundraising. We yeah. just put this in it's there just for in there transparency for so that yeah. everyone can see that um, as we move throughout the course of the year, um, these are 
the fundraising items that have taken place and the dollar amounts that have ra been raised due to them. Thank you. My intent was not to put anybody on the spot there. I, I think I had just seen it as, re as important. And I know eight, nine, ten years ago, there was a there was a broader community, a statewide question about what was fundraising and how frequently was it happening and how many times were the same kids being asked. So I know this is a this is a tale from a community questions a decade ish or so ago. So thank you. Does anybody have any follow up questions or observations with regard to the fundraising report? Um, all right, hearing none, this is the point in the agenda, Director Tate, where the school board self-evaluation discussion was added. I presume you can lead us in that discussion. Um, so previously, um, Director Weissel and I were the committee for this and we dissolved that, but we had agreed that we would use the MSBA um, self-evaluation form, which means that we would use their tool and then they provide um, a very comprehensive report back mm -hmm. to us. Um, so I guess what I'd like to propose for everyone since June is extremely busy. Um, perhaps um, uh, I'd, I'd volunteer to do it myself. I can reach out to MSBA to get the tools and find out what we need to get from them um, to do the evaluation. And then I would propose that we maybe have it done by the end of June so that we could discuss it um, perhaps in the July work session. I don't know if there's room in there or for over. consideration at least for July since it would be in line with the timing. Well, I, I know I'm certainly comfortable with, and I'm trying to read and speak at the same time, sorry. I'm certainly comfortable with you reaching out to MSBA and seeing what the next steps are to implement that self-evaluation, if that's a link that they send out, whatever that is, um, to do that. I think that would be great. Um, Yeah, I think July is, is sort of our last, the July work session is an opportunity to develop that last referendum strategy and project plan. That's sort of our big, big topic in July, um, as well as starting to get into those first conversations with our incoming superintendent around 23, 24 goals. So I think whether that ends up being a July or August time frame, I think we can see based on when MSBA can get things out. It, August feels slightly less busy to me, but Okay. Be in that time frame. Okay. I'll reach out then. Thank you. Okay. Does, does anybody else have any input that they'd like to give on that discussion? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so I'm putting it on the work calendar in a, in a work session right now. Um, the July one's pretty early. Um, I threw it in the August one, but it can go, it can switch back and forth. We'll see where we're at with how much referendum work it feels like there is in July. And once we hear back from MSBA on timelines. All right, the next update belongs to me, and this is with regard to ISD 917. There's three files attached. Um, the first is a standards of effective practice from Pelra which is a professional educating educators organization through Department of Ed. Um, Dr. McDowell provided this to us as a link back in April. Um, and then I, I saw it again, it came up again at 917. This is, this is about providing, this is state adopted standards for programs that are educating teachers. So this doesn't, this isn't reliant, this isn't us integrating this in our practice, but this is what teachers are being taught and programs need to demonstrate that they're teaching this with the goal of bringing teachers in who are, so that they're prepared coming into the classrooms, that there's less likely that we can improve retention and that they have the skill sets necessary. It came up in the 917 meeting because 917 is developing some professional development that they're rolling out this summer and that is that meets these 
new standards and some of the gaps that may not have existed in previous places. So I think the link for us looking forward, and it'll be interesting to, to hear as 917 rolls this out and, and how much response they have to, to, to their new programs and new, new training is, I think we can anticipate seeing conversations because this is incoming teachers, teachers that are be graduating and coming into the workforce versus teachers that are currently in the workforce. And I think there's gonna be conversations and pressures around staff development and filling those gaps. So it's just a place to look at it. And I thought it was relevant because we saw it in both uh, Dr. McDowell's update and then it came up again in 917. And then the second piece that I think is of interest for us tonight is the, the second two attachments and that's regarding 917's long-term facilities maintenance 10 year expenditure plan. We, that was approved at the 917 board table earlier in May and, and then it's allocated out to the nine districts, um, participating districts and our portion is an action item in, later in today's topic. And I'm sorry, I've, I, I had forgotten to, to send that to uh, Ms. Garcia until you pointed out that it wasn't linked there. So um, we have both the 10 the year plan that was submitted to the state as well as an appendix that gives just a little more detail about the specifics. And, um, and that's kind of 917 um, as it stands right now. Director Zuzik, I don't know if you or Director Dressley is taking the um, policy committee update. Um, Director Malm was. You have to play the same game. You can't. You can't play. Have one person playing the pointing game and one person doing rock paper scissors. No, no, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, you got to be ready. You got to do both at the same time. You got to do nose just in case it's the nose game and then have this hand going just so that you're ready to win. I'm, I'm happy to do it. So All right. There we go. Director Zuzik's going to give us our policy go. committee update. I'll tell you what, there is a lot going on in the policy committee. And so I, I, as I go through it, I'll try to not talk about policy numbers and talk about what the policy names are because they give you a sense of what the policies are. It's helpful for the audience. The first one is the facilities naming policy. The big news on that one is the board has decided and, and the policy is written in such a way that it's not written, uh, it, it is written in such a way that we won't be naming places after people. And what happened because we made that decision is it shortened the policy by more than 50%. So it, it, it uh, goes a long way. And of course, um, we had a, a, a very rich discussion about that last month on the at the board level at one of our work sessions. And so we're following that policy and you're going to see that um, you're going to see that policy come up later in the meeting tonight. And just know that there are some formatting corrections that will take place after the contents approved. Another one is the code of ethics. And I appreciate the feedback that we got from uh, board members and what we've done is incorporate some of the, frankly, some of the really well written pieces from, oh gosh, the, the district, Osseo School District had a, just a real user-friendly code of ethics and it, they, they were organized differently, but there were some places where frankly their language was better. And most of what's reflected here is additions due to what Osseo Public Schools has in their, in their policy. It is, I think it's, softer language, it still means the same uh, generally, but it's softer and it's more user-friendly language. And we had a, a, a for instance, in, an ad that was outside of the Osseo one was adding language about fiduciary responsibility. It's a key component of working on a public school board and it wasn't called out directly, so now it will be. Another one is separating, uh, not separating, articulating the difference between responsibility and accountability and who holds accountability and who holds responsibility and, and, and what things do we have accountability and what things do we have responsibility. So it's just a, a really rich amount of uh, discussion on that one as well. And again, you're gonna see that later in the meeting, I think first reading, I think first reading, yeah. It, and then the policy on public participation in school board meetings, uh, complaints and persons about the school board and data privacy considerations, that is really, when, when you hear that long title, what it's really referring to is the listening sessions. And we wanna, we wanna um, maintain um, 
a listening session, and yet we talked about not wanting to box us into operationally how it's done by having a policy that's only reviewed every three years. And so last time at the board table when we had a discussion, we were scratching our heads at the end of the meeting. And so when we went to the policy committee meeting, we decided to have a policy uh, procedure that runs along with that, that policy and it will be for the board's benefit, it will be policy 206.2. Uh, point one is actually the sign up procedure for signing up, but point two is think of um, time, place, and manner. So we, we didn't want to say every Wednesday it starts at 545 or name a time. When it starts is before the board meetings and a future board might say because people had conflicts on Wednesdays, they might be meeting on Tuesday night. So it's gonna be on Tuesday night. Maybe they wanna start at seven instead of six. And so we we are saying that the 15 minutes uh, prior to the, to the board meeting will be a listening session and all of the board will be present for the listening session. But whether it's live streamed, the policy doesn't talk about. That's talked about in, poli in, in the policy, uh, to, uh, in the procedure 206.2, because then on a periodic basis, the board can change that more quickly. If they want it to be more public, if they want it to be live streamed, if they want it to be recorded, if they want it to be um, whatever the case might be. And we can't lock ourselves in on a lot of those procedural things because frankly, our, our relationship with H, H, uh, GC, or HTC, HCTV, not HGTV. Um, well, I, I don't, but I, it's, that's on the living room TV. Um, but anyhow, it, we, we are, you know, we're, we're, we've got a great relationship with them, but gosh, if things changed, it might make it impossible or more challenging to to uh, have it recorded, have it live streamed. This was really, uh, the, there's a policy that we had on the books about uh, nurses being able to administer medication like epinephrine um, if needed, that would be like an EpiPen. And we wanted to broaden it to include Narcan for uh, for kids that, or, or staff, I suppose, that were in need of Narcan, um, or the public if they were in the schools in, in need of Narcan. And there was some really good discussion about that, and specifically, the biggest change is that we separated out Narcan from epinephrine because the procedures are basically the same, but the how it's indicated is different. And so it, it was a, a sensible recommendation and, and we incorporated that. The curriculum development one is, we, we really passed. We're gonna pass on the second reading. I don't think it's in there for today. We're pausing on it because uh, we, we need to get some feedback from uh, Director Larson and, um, and Dr. McDowell. Um, at our next at our next policy meeting, which is May thirty first, so it's next Wednesday, and then the policy related to school district accountability systems. Because of all of the good work that we did with, I think six oh one, because of that good work, we were able to strike the vast majority of this policy, because the language was so parallel and so redundant because it was parallel to it. So we, it just, it really shortened it up. The, the world's best workforce is now the advisory committee. Um, it just, remember that we had, I think four readings on 601 and um, it was worth the time to do that one right because it's helping with a lot of other things. Another policy similar to that, the, there's a policy on grading and it related in part to 601, but frankly, our recommendation on that is that we just clean up a little bit on the way that it's laid out and some of the references that are in it, some of the, some of the formatting, because that is a really big nut to crack. And right now we've got innovation, innovation teams at the elementary, the middle school and the high school. And so it, we need to have that good work done first before we, 
charge the administration to to work on a grading procedure and and a grading and to give us feedback on grading policy so you're going to see it come through as a, a, a what will probably be a pretty quick pass and just you know a, a renewal of the of the policy without a lot of deep consideration but know that we intend to ask the uh, administration to really come back with a very thorough look at that in the coming years probably in the coming year but that depends on where the innovation teams go long and the short of it is a lot going on in policy there's a whole body of policy about administration. I think it's the, it is the 300 policy series about administration. And we thought about wrestling that one to the ground too, but now we're getting into summer and remember that summer is when we have to do a lot of the mandatory. Then we have two major mandatory things. And then we'll also be looking for MSBA to give us whatever the, the updates are on that. So it's, it's likely that if we start on the 30 at the 300 level, we might be doing a lot of that work in the background and then bring it forth. Um, when it, after we've taken a look at it. But uh, Director Dressley, any comments? I would just like to add the school board, um, the school board member development piece, oh, um, 212. Yes, um, we just added some wording for new board members to add a minimum re review policy outlined in the handbook. Um, we added some wording about the board um, should try to send two members to a national conference periodically at the discretion of the sitting board and also recommended verbiage from policy 412 um, to be added to the handbook and outline the expense reimbursement portion of 412. All right, thank you for that summary. And then this is where it always gets slightly weird because then we move directly from a policy summary to which, which gave us an overview of the work that's being done and a number of the items that are coming forward into first and second readings were discussed. But now we're going to um, have an opportunity to have individual discussion if we wanna do that at the table with regard to our first and second reading. So if, if you could lead us in that discussion as well, Director Zuzik, I see the first policy for first reading is 209 Code of Ethics. The code of ethics again you're going to see a little bit of uh, language and uh, it, for the public to know when you when you look at board book and see our documents you can see how they've changed from the last time that this policy was renewed and the recommendations that we have and you see that you know we strike out the language and then the new language is always in a color and some of sometimes they're in a lot of different colors but all right, so on, on this one, again, what you see here is really a reflection of what we saw from the OSSEO policy that was better written. And, um, and then the ad of fiduciary specifically on D4. D4. The fiduciary uh, responsibility is named and then under the references, what we've gone to is just having Minnesota statute references and then the cross references to local uh, policies and there are no cross references for this one. We recommend that. Um, it's just for first reading. Yep. Are there any comments on that one? Yes. Um, so I, I had sent my comments earlier to Vice Chair Malm, not knowing she wasn't going to be here, of course. Oh, sorry. Um, so I know you haven't seen them yet, but I will forward these to you after um, our discussion tonight. Good. Um, so I, first of all, I appreciate the, the changes that were made um, relative to Osseo's policy. I do appreciate their policy and, and, and how we've rewritten some of the things. Um, I also, I re-reviewed Osseo's policy and I looked at a few others as well. And I have three suggestions for additions and would like to know um, what the board as a whole thinks about these. Um, under section 2A, as a board member of the school board, or as a member of the school board, I will. Um, and my, my suggestion is to add, be respectful to others when performing my duties as a board, as a school board member. So that's the first one, if anyone has feedback on that. 
so I, I'm going to say just personally, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that as a general statement of human practice towards other humans. Um, I'm going to find it challenging to reply to comments tonight, but I think if we see if we see stuff incorporated into second readings but after the policy, I mean, yeah. I, I would trust the policy committee to dig into that conversation and look for um, application and redundancy, and then I'd be happy to get feedback when we see it in second reading. So I do have these marked um, to go over in our policy committee meeting on the 31st, and all of the grammatical um, changes have already been suggested and. and accepted so they're already all done for the grammatical changes okay yep um second one is or what was that sorry were they all grammatical no oh, oh pardon me no um the second edition is in section 2b which is in performing the proper functions of a school board member i will um, my recommendation is to add oversee district management by employing a superintendent and evaluating their performance in providing leadership managing operations and performing duties assigned by law um, that was a modification of what was in osseo's policy and we don't have anything in ours regarding evaluate superintendent evaluation um, and then section 2d uh, under that portion, that portion is in meeting my responsibilities to my community, I will. My recommendation is to add regularly review student and staff key performance indicators, staff resources, and all conditions affecting education as a part of my accountability to the communities I serve. That is also another adaptation from Osseo's that we don't have that content currently included in our policy. I think like where they end up in the numeration, it, we'll, we'll, we'll just think through that. Like the be respectful, that seems like it would come to the top of the list uh, for that for that series. And that last one might be item five under section D, but yeah, thank you. And, and I don't feel compelled to read through this, but I did also provide some written comments to the okay. policy committee um, last week. And it I think it's, it was a, personal comment and the board, the committee can talk it through and we'll see what comes through in second read. So. We do have those on our, for, yeah. for the three. Yep. Yeah, so we'll just continue the conversation, but thank you for bringing this forward. The next policy is the policy for school board member development and um, to avoid redundancy that this is exactly what uh, Director Dressley talked about. Um, encouraging all, all new school board members to read all policy um, b before before they're they're seated. I think that that's important. It's a part of what what needs to happen. And then school board will strive to send two school board members to a national conference. And yep, that was it. So pretty straightforward. Any. Yeah, and again, I, I had provided a comment to this, but okay. I trust that you guys will have the conversation and decide whether it. Thank it, you. It, it, there's a majority of the policy committee that wants to incorporate it or not. I'll show you what a lot of color can look like in a policy. <laughs> On policy 630, which is the. Um, School district curriculum and instructional goals. Remember that this one is dramatically affected by the the um, more thorough writing of 601. And it, as you scroll through, really, it's just um, a number of you know reductions in in wording because it was redundant. And the last one on first Direct, read. Director yes. Jade has a comment. Pardon me. I think for to calling my attention to yes. That's okay. Um, actually, I have a few questions on this one. Okay. Um, first, I was wondering uh, why are we renumbering it from six eighteen to six thirty? So the reason we chose to do that is because MSBA has a six eighteen currently. Um, so we didn't want to we didn't want that to be a conflict for a later board or a later policy committee to. Why isn't this um? Why is this not matching up with MSBA's model policy number? So we just moved it out to six thirty, so that we're not interfering with any other policy numbers that are from MSBA model policies. Okay, thank you. Um, 
And then I was wondering, um, in the body of the, the policy um, under section two, it looks like number eight, uh, section two A, numbers three and four are being eliminated. I was wondering why um, you're proposing that those be struck from the policy. And for the listeners. Thank you. For the, for the listeners and viewers, uh, under this portion of the policy, the, the category is the purpose of student grading includes providing incentives to learn and evaluating the effectiveness of, of instructional programs and classroom instruction. And the, the gist of it is that what we want the grade to reflect is what the student has learned. And the grades, Grades should not be incentive. It, um, the, the, as a as a matter of principle, there are kids that are incentivized by grades, but it, um, that that's not the intent of the grade. Okay. Um. Sorry, I'm just rereading. Yeah. The, the, the number four, evaluating the effectiveness of instructional programs and classroom instruction. So wouldn't, I, I guess, if you look at grades, right, and you see that all of the kids in the class are getting, say, a C and below, wouldn't that be an indicator of the quality of the instructional programs and that may, perhaps something needs to be revamped? Because I, I would think that that would be one possible tool that would be an indicator for that. Yeah, would you kindly? I don't recall that conversation. So the purpose of grades, if we look at them, um, and in its most simplest form, if you have a report card that comes home, I would argue that when you look at your student's report card and you see a C or C minus, the <coughs> grade does not reflect the instructional program that took place. The grade is a reflection of how well the student did right of what the student had learned and that's because <laughs> grades as a matter of function are formative they should be forming informing us on student learning not on teacher instruction teacher instruction is evaluated through our teacher growth and development framework and our instructional practice framework our 5d that we've adopted and so Inherently in the way that this was originally written is is part of the issue that isn't just in Hastings It's nationwide is this concept and this question of what is the purpose of grades and And it can vary it, grades just are not a way to evaluate the effectiveness of instructional programs um, It could if you look at that word or you look at that at its face value evaluating the effectiveness of instructional programs first of all that would mean if we have a underwater basket weaving program what we're saying is that the grades that the students get indicates the the uh, effectiveness of that program that would there's no correlation there it doesn't get correlated the effectiveness of the program is our kids learning um, are, are, are we getting what they want? The other, the other piece of classroom instruction on that piece, the, the easiest entry point there is to say, well, what if a person just isn't using good grading practice and kids are getting C minuses when actually the grades themselves don't reflect at all what the kids know and are able to do. That's, that's not anything to do with classroom instruction. That's to do with a person's ability or lack of ability to effectively grade in the classroom. And so there's, it can get so convoluted that we really need to look at that in A, the purpose of student grading. So grading of a student, what is the purpose of that? And one and two capture that, right? the achievement level what a kid knows and is able to do what does it communicate it communicates to parents and others what a student knows and is able to do and it can be used if students are and have a lot of self-efficacy and um, metacognitive thought self-evaluation beyond that it gets convoluted 
Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. Um, the other, oh, uh, well, related but not. So um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the other thing that I just noticed about this policy is that it, and I don't think I've seen this with another policy, is that it ends with definitions. So we've got the purpose, the general statement of policy, and then definitions. And typically the flow is that, that after the definitions that you get into the meat of the policy. Um, so just wondering why this one is a, has a different setup. That's a, that, that's a good catch. I agree that, that it's not structured in the same order and it makes sense to structure it by having definitions first. Good catch. Thank you. Um, and then this is the related but not exactly. So when I was, I did look up the MSBA model 618 policy um, and I'm just wondering if there are any plans to create a 618 at all. Um, I know it's not required, but I, when I looked at it, it includes a lot of legal references. It is the, it's the, the title of it is assessment of student achievement. So re related to grading, right? But not exact. So I don't know if the policy committee has discussed that or not. If not, I would maybe suggest that you do. Thank you. That'll be a good conversation to have when uh, Dr. Larson and Dr. McDowell are both present, or Director Larson and Dr. McDowell are both present. Thank you. Thank you. The last one on, on the first reading is the naming policy. This is 908 for our language and naming policy for the, the public. And you'll see, just scrolling through that one, it, a lot is struck. Um, and I, I'll just open, be open to question or comment. Yeah. Um, so in general, I guess I'm going to have a hard time voting for this policy and I've, I've stated it before. It's just, I don't feel comfortable completely shutting the door on naming things after people. Um, while we would advise against it, there may be some future board at some future time that would like to do that anyway. Um, but if we are moving forward with rewriting this, uh, this way, I believe the, um, last sentence of um, portion two would need to be would need to have a bunch of the language struck um, because currently it reads uh, facility names may reflect geographical locations topographical characteristics significant historical or social events concepts central to democracy or properly vetted prominent persons of local national or international repute so that would need to be struck and that is the only comments I have. Thank you. And did you make that with uh, that comment to Director Mom? Thanks too, because th that'll be easy to take care of. Then on to second reading once, unless there's no more questions. Second reading, our policy 516, that this is the one about student medication. You see the big changes in this one really occur in letter E. Roman numeral three, letter E, where we separate out Narcan from the epinephrine use. And that was a that was a good suggestion. It made sense. And most of the most of the policy uh, does remain the same, however. Yes. Um, just one. I, I'm just curious. So the section F with the epinephrine. Um, Number one, I'm just curious, because right now it has just Minnesota statute listed with a question mark and then a link. Yep. Is that going to be changed to verbiage that, I don't know. So when we looked at this, we were looking at what the statute was for the ep, for the EpiPen. Yep. And it's a different statute for Narcan. Narcan. So once we have that exact statute, that will be updated and, and reflected correctly. Yeah. And then I think you're going to speak to Mike. Oh, I'm sorry. Just to make a note that the 
the way that <clears throat> in the new K-12 bill, yeah. it'll be a requirement. It's timely because it'll be a requirement for us to have two doses, a minimum of two doses of um, Narcan in Lots each one of our buildings. Thank you. <laughs> Director. Director Dress, I'm asking the question. It, in both cases, it's similar language, though. It has to do with the Good Samaritan concept. It's just different with Narcan than epinephrine. Yeah. That Thank is you. correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other further, further discussion? And on to school district systems accountability. A relatively short policy with a whole heck of a lot of cross references. <laughs> That's why it's here. Any comments? Holy buckets. Isn't that something? There's a whole page of references. <laughs> well, I guess it makes it a pretty important policy. All right. Um, I, I think that is the end of policy discussion. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for stepping in in uh, place of vice chair and, and moving us through that. Um, I believe that's the last of our report and discussion items. We're going to move on to action items. Our board work. Our first action is I would accept a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda. So move. Second. Okay. I'm sorry, I was looking down. Was that motion, Director Tate? Okay, motion, Director Tate, second, Director Dressley to adopt the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign, motion carries unanimously. Now we'll move on to items for individual action. The first item is a resolution. And I would, um, as the 917 rep, I would um, move adoption of the 917 LTFM resolution, but waive the reading. Mm -hmm. Second, Davis. Yeah, I know when you read just the top of the resolution, it's who introduces it, but I think as you go further down the resolution, you do have to have a second. So we have motion Hideen, second Davis, to adopt the 917 resolution, but waive the reading. Is there any discussion? Um, I believe we have a practice of using roll call vote on resolution. Director Davis, if you could lead us in that, please. Absolutely. It's better than having to read the whole resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Director Zuzik. Uh, yes. Chair Dean. Yes. Director Davis, yes. Director Tate. Yes. Director Dressley. Yes. The yeses have it. All right. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Our section, second, or our next action item, I'm not going to keep count of how many we have. The next action item is a property and liability and workers' comp recommendation. Um, Director Subert, would you like to give a, a summary? I, I know there's a document provided that indicates um, changes from the previous year. Do you have anything to add to that? Okay, that looks like a no, and don't call on me again. If I had to read that facial expression, that's my read. Um, yeah, why don't you talk about it for a second, and then I promise I won't call on you again. Well, tonight, tonight. <laughs> Okay, so our annual renewals are in for both um, our MIST insurance program, which is our property and casualty insurance, as well as our workers' compensation. And you can see in the document that there are um, increases on both of those, which you know we had expected. Um, property and casualty insurance has about an overall 23% increase. Some of the major contributing factors are inflation, um, that the property values. So we had a new um, 
valuation done on our properties and the the values did increase so that help that contributes to the increase in premium and then um, school districts or public se sector employers are seeing an increase in the sexual abuse and school board legal claims um, across the state. Um, so that also contributes to it. Um, there was a good um, component of this, which was the cyber insurance. So that was a flat renewal. Um, in the past years, we have seen significant increases on that. Um, but we, um, there's many requirements that we're required to meet now. So that has helped uh, stabilize that insurance. And then the last piece on this is through MIST, there's an actuarial um, debit, debit credit system. And this year we had a 4% credit on the package and a 7% credit on the loss fund, um, which is much better than what we had last year being a 3% debit on the package and a 1% debit on the loss fund. And those um, credit debit system is all based on previous five years experience and claims. As far as workers' comp, um, overall it's a 6.01% increase, and that's based on our, our mod rate. So it went from a 0.8 to a 0.85, which would um, lead to an, an increase in the overall cost. And then we use an agency, which is McGuire, and uh, their rate remained the same. Thank you. Did anybody have any discussions on this? Just a quick comment for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Director Subert, the, that mod rate for workers' comp going from 0.8 to 0.85 still leaves us in pretty good shape, frankly, because what you want your mod rate to be is 1.0 or less because that, that, that's our comparison to, to similar employers in a, in a similar uh, situated career field. So that's a good number, although there is an increase there. So that good work on our safety people. Is there any further discussion with regard to the motion on the table to adopt uh, or approve the 2023-24 rates? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign, motion carries unanimously. Our next action is approval of the public participation in school board meetings, complaint about persons at school board meetings, and I'm sorry, I have a note in front of my, a note in front of my title, and data privacy considerations. Sorry, I forgot that word. I would consider a motion, I would entertain a motion in a second to approve this revised policy. I would forward that motion. Second, Dressley. You can have it. <laughs> Motion Zuzik, second, Dressley. Is there any discussion? Director Tate. Um, I had voiced this concern uh, once before, and I apologize, I could not find my notes in the chaos of the day. Um, but on uh, section 6G, um, it states. Personal attacks by anyone addressing the school board are unacceptable. Persistence in such remarks by an individual shall terminate that person's privilege to address the, the school board. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about this. Can you rest Could you restate the reference? Um, I lost- Six G. I lost G. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I thought G. I heard you say C and I couldn't find where you were reading. Right. Thank you. Got it. Um, and again, while I do absolutely do not encourage personal attacks, um, it is legal to um, go after elected officials verbally. Um, and so I, the, the concern that I have is seeing this play out in the fact that this isn't going to be reviewed for three years, right? There's a chance that none of us will be here three years from now. And if, um, a, say, a board chair um, terminated an individual's right to dis address the school board after they made some sort of a slanderous type comment at a school board member, that is a First Amendment right infringement and opens us up to a potential lawsuit. So um, in the past, I had requested, if we're talking about staff and that, I, I believe that we, we really need to add that verbiage in there to say that personal attacks um, by anyone against staff, students, 
um, whatnot, it, basically non-school board members is unacceptable and won't be permitted and they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll lose their rights. But um, again, while I don't encourage anyone to personally attack any of us, it is legal. So I'm just concerned about the liability. I am in favor of the way that this policy has been rewritten, except for that one point. I would just like to comment on that. I don't think the intent of what is written here is to um, to terminate a person's privilege to ever address the, the school board. I think that the intent of it is if somebody is continuously attacking and verbally just, um, assaulting someone that the board chair has the right to say we're not gonna we're not gonna sit here and allow you to continue this this behavior and i i well i appreciate that it's perfectly legal you can't stop them from doing that there is it's it's um it's there's it's federal case law that you cannot stop a person from verbally attacking a, a an elected official can you stop them from physically attacking I certainly hope so. <laughs> I think away from the table, we need some time to look at that as the policy committee. Um, and if you could get me any reference about it, that, that would be helpful. I, I, I know I mentioned it. I, I yeah, rewatched last month. I rewatched last, I month. I rewatched last month. It. Apparently, it wasn't last month, so it must yeah. have been two months ago when I brought it up. So I'll have to. I have to go find the case law. Yeah, thank notes. you. I apologize yep. for asking you to do that again. Yep. No, that's fine. I'll find thank it. Thank you. Okay. Given that, and the motion on the table is to approve this, and I will say that as a group and its policy committee in particular has been at this for quite some time. I, I'm just pondering right now, so I, I have, I'm not sure I've formed a personal opinion about this, but I would consider if we would have the opportunity to, because where we stand now is we would have to decline its approval and send it back to policy. We would have to vote against its approval and send it back to policy, which means we stay with our current practice of listening sessions. And then maybe it comes back modified or maybe it doesn't based on whether policy needs to do a, have, have our legal counsel review it or review some revised language. Or we could consider, I think we have to reflect individually on if we would support its implementation, which would change how listening sessions currently look, and then catch up a change to that. Do you have a, a reflection on, I, I would take a reflection from anybody on personal preference to, to that point. And maybe I'll um, just start with somebody different in work away around, Director Dressley. Thank you. I, I would really like to see this policy move forward just in, with the caveat that, you know, we will obviously look at this if we're breaking, we don't want to be breaking the law. Of course, we wouldn't break the law. Um, I mean, we, we can't create a policy that, that, that breaks the law. I will say, that for, and I think I spoke to this previously, 917 last two months ago, adopted a policy with regard to um, recording and recording devices with regard to parents. And they had created a policy that um, asks, essentially, members of the public, it prohibits students and it asks members of the public and parents to not record or at least ask to record. That being said, they cannot be declined. They cannot legally be declined. It's a statement of values. It's a statement of expectations, but it's it cannot override state statute. So it, it's that's not exactly the same situation here, but but that's a thing that happened in my experience in the last couple months with that regard. May I make a suggestion that we approve this policy, but we strike that one comment tonight? And then if the policy committee deems that we can add it back in and ensure that we're following that that case law, um, then we readdress that in the future. So that's a third alternative. Um, but that's a mod, my, my concern there is we don't have a practice of making an amendment 
and changing a policy on a final reading and approving it <coughs> because we haven't had robust conversation. So I, I personally, I mean, I, that's just a thing to consider in that. So we're either, we either send it back, adopt it as is, and we've spoken at the table to its intent and our understanding of its intent. And the, the intent is not to halt people who are using personal verbal attacks against school board members. And so we've spoken to that intent. Or we, we establish a practice, I guess, tonight of striking something out of a final reading and approving it. Those are the three alternatives I see on the table. Again, the motion right now is to approve it as it stands. Director Davis, do you have a perspective on what you'd like to see going forward? And Director Zuzek. I would be of, I don't want to wait to approve it because the public is waiting for this to be done. I think that what I would rather do is, I, I, I would recommend that we approve it as written, given that we've had verbal com conversation at the table about its intent, and we will look into it, and then we'll understand the law well, and maybe even have legal way in on it. And then if need be, we can revise it, although it, would, it may be revised very soon. I'd, I'd still rather get this, the, this policy done so that we can move to, to our intended practice. That would be my sense of urgency about it. Director Davis, do you have a perspective on on the likely route forward? And then we'll probably close down discussion and we'll either have to take a vote or consider an adaptation. As a clarifying, just as a clarifying question, first of all, um, is it in Minnesota State statute that someone has the right to address the board? No. Okay. If that's um, the not in general, not in a general board meeting. Okay. There's there so. Should we consider extending the levy? That's a statutory requirement. During the truth and taxation, that's, that's a statutory, statutory yep. requirement. Thank you. I would say that um, I'd be in favor of uh, Pro Director Zuzik and Director Dressley of moving this forward, but very quickly having the committee take a look at G and determining if it's legal. Because to Director Tate's point, if it's not, we need to clean that up quickly. But I have no, I know how much work has been put into this. I have no problem passing it, just knowing that we're going to take a look at that and make sure we're okay on that piece as well. So I've already sent the question to legal while we're discussing, discussing this. Um, so we'll have that quick. I would remind the board that um, while in a general sense, my guess is what legal is going to come back with is that in a general sense, the federal law does allow. <clears throat> It does allow provisions under First Amendment. However, the school board also has the right to control the decorum at a board meeting and therefore can put time, place, manner restriction, restrictions on the general public to include what they are allowed to say and not say when you have things like that going on. So that'd be my guess as you're moving forward. It's probably a both and. There's probably parameters around it if that helps in your decision but we'll find out from legal. Is there any further discussion? Okay. So the motion on the table is to approve policy 206 with its full title as written. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Okay. So the those voting in favor are Dressley Davis, Hedin, and Zuzik voting in opposition, Tate. Um, and so this goes into practice. I want everybody to keep that, all those people, the board, keep that in mind that our expectation now is that there's a, a request requirement in the event that a community member wishes to speak to the board during a listening session. The sign up time has been modified in this. Um, policy and they need to contact 
um, <laughs> administrative assistant at the district office. I'm just double checking for the time. I'm sorry, I've lost track of that in the in all of this discussion. I think it's 8 a.m. 8 a.m. the day prior to. That's what I remember. I'm just trying to trying to read it. 8 a.m. the day prior to the meeting. You need to contact um, Ms. Becky Garcia at the district office and sign up. Um, I would think from a practical perspective, we'll hear from Ms. Garcia in the course of that that day if we would need to be here and be ready to um, listen to a public input. And as it stands under our current schedule, that would be starting at 545 as we st start with six o'clock meetings. So um, that's on record. I will point out two other things. One, Dr. McDowell, when you receive feedback from from legal, if it's a yes and, if you could um, just frame that for us and share that with the board so that we all have common understanding. And then I had hoped to talk about three times today, my goal was to talk three times today about the legislative guidance on approved a board's opportunity to renew an existing levy. So we've spoken about it with in the superintendent's report. I'm gonna to speak to it here. <coughs> there is a reference in policy 206, which was just adopted about public hearings and using the same practice of time and decorum and length of time to speak. Um, and generally, it's, if we were gonna have a public hearing, say on a budget adjustment or a school boundary realignment, asking for sign up in advance so we had an understanding. In the event that we have a public hearing or during a public hearing for the board to consider extending the levy, that's a, there's a state statutory, statutory requirement about that and there will not be prior sign up. It will be on that day. And I, that would be the same for truth and taxation. That's a, you, you hold the meeting, you open the meeting, people are welcome to attend. So those are two particular examples where the state statute would over, override some of the guidance that we're providing in here. And I just want people to be aware of that because that's gonna be a question uh, in front of our community and board shortly. And there will not be a requirement to sign up d a day in advance and let people know. There would be an expectation you can come and speak on that day. Thank you. Our next action item for tonight is an international trip approval. And there's a attached proposal for a, it's not gonna load, but for a trip to Puerto Rico. Oh, there it goes. Um, I would entertain a motion in a second to approve that trip. So moved, Dressley. Second, Tate. Motion Dressley, second, Tate. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Do we have an abstention tonight? Yes, Davis abstains based on the relationship with the author of the proposal. Terrific, um, I appreciate you giving an explanation for the abstention. We have four in favor, none opposed, and one abstention. And with that, the international trip is approved. Our next action item is the 2023-2024 Minnesota State <coughs> High School League membership resolution. I would entertain a motion in a second to adopt this resolution and waiving of the reading. Zuzik. <laughs> second, Kate. <laughs> If only we hadn't been here so many days in a row, we would have all appreciated hearing Director Davis read the resolution in its detail. But we just don't have it in us anymore, apparently. We're already kind of dropping around the edges. Um, okay, excuse me. So we have a motion by Director Zuzik, second by Director Tate, is that accurate? Yes. To adopt the resolution. Is there any discussion? Uh, with a waiver of the reading. Hearing that, um, <clears throat> Treasurer Davis, will you please call roll? Absolutely. Director Dressley? Yes. Director Tate? Yes. Director Zuzik? Yes. Chair Hedin? Yes. Director Davis, yes. Thank you. Our next um, action item, and very much out of practice, but because this is a time dependent um, action where as we're asking for rec there's been pre presented a recommendation for approval of Juneteenth June 19th is a paid holiday as of in June of 2023 
this is an action that was undertaken legislatively, um, I think today, and is gonna go into effect for this year. It had been anticipated for 2024, but the, the implementation is this year and it will impact our summer school. And so um, we need to take action on that tonight, given that we don't have a meeting um, where we can take this action prior to that. Could I get a motion and second for that, for its approval? So moved, Davis. Second, Zuzik. All right. Is there any discussion? Do you want to share anything in addition, Dr. Mattel? Yeah, just to reiterate, the original intent of the legislation was for it to start in 2024. That would have given us time to organize how we're doing stuff. We have uh, things already planned for June as part of summer school and things like that. We also have uh, different bargaining groups that have their holidays already set. And so um, that's why this is on here at the last minute is we want to keep this as simple as possible for this year, give us time to plan for 2024. And as you can see in the second paragraph, we've done our best to articulate the fact that really this, this is going to impact our people who are covered under collective bargaining and under terms and conditions of their employment. Typically, they're the people that are here full time scheduled to work on June 19th as part of their regular schedule. It doesn't include people that signed up to teach summer school or are non-contracted, but it would add a holiday, which is why we want you as a board to approve it so that it's clear to everybody what's exactly happening for this summer uh, because of the legislative change. And I will point out that this recommendation is to approve it as a paid holiday for 2023. And I don't think I was clear in the original um, summary of where we're at. And then going forward, it would still be a state holiday, but it would it could be incorporated into contracts and bargaining agreements. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right, opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. And then quite possibly the most popular action we ever take annually is to identify the last day of school for 12th graders as June 2nd. This does not affect anybody else's schedule. Sorry, all you juniors. But um, to make June 2nd the last day of school for 12th, 12th graders, I would entertain a motion and a second for that approval. So moved, Dressley. Second, Dave. <laughs> last year was a battle because we had a lot of senior parents around the table. This year we're all like a little chill. All right, uh, motion second, second, Tate. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign, motion passes unanimously. With that, we'll move to future meetings, which is currently titled future meetings, but it will change to um, future meetings and topics. So we do have a continue, we continue to have a fair amount of work in front of us. Um, we have the attached document, which has dates and times and locations. We anticipate a single item special meeting on May 31st to approve a superintendent's contract for our incoming superintendent, um, Dr. Tamara Champa. June 14th, which is scheduled as a, had been scheduled as a regular meeting of the board for a work session is, is it going to be or it's likely to be? It is going to be, and I ask that only to make sure that nothing changed in the legislative language, is going to be changed for a special meeting for the board to consider approval of the levy and referendum renewal. And this meeting will include public, te public testimony, which people will not have to sign up for in advance. And that's um, a Wednesday evening. I anticipate a six o'clock start time. We also have uh, anticipate having a closed session for our second conversation with regard to negotiations parameters now that we have um, some clarity around the legislative language and dollars for upcoming contracts that will be entering into negotiations this summer. There is a business meeting, a regular business meeting June 28th. And at that meeting, we will be approving, we're required to approve the 22-23 um, budget. Now we've had a briefing on that. We'll have discussions with regards 23, 24. I have it written down 23, 24. 
I cannot even think the numbers are that big. Okay, correct. We'll be approving the 23-24 budget. We've had conversations with regard to budget. We had, um, and then the parameters conversation and legislative update are giving us more and more detail every day. We have a work session in July. The anticipated topics will be a directional check on the referendum because I think we've had at our last work session, we had a conversation about even if um, the, our board chooses to renew the levy and its current state, length of time, inflationary factor, and um, dollar level, we would need to consider or will be considering a capital, a capital improvement levy or a tech levy. We're also anticipating a presentation by the Director of Teaching and Learning with regard to our gifted and talented program, differentiated teaching and um, curriculum process, process. And right now I have it under other future topics that we'll be talking about a school board self-evaluation. So whether that ends up being July or August, depending on workload and MSBA's response. Um, again, it, it's on the calendar. and. And our other upcoming topics, horizon topics, people are aware that we're talking about them and be happy to hear public input on, are going to be establishing superintendent goals for the 23-24 school year. Um, continue our conversation about transitioning from an odd to an even year voting, how that would happen and what a, putting a timeline in place for that if it's something we want to consider. We've talked, and this has been a while, but it's been on our calendar, is considering the addition of a student school board member. And as I, as I see the you know next school year starting in September, we, want, we can coordinate with MSBA and other districts that have it and find when's the best time to do that and process to incorporate a, a student school board member. Um, updating the board handbook as we go through policies 200 and build the processes that go with that. I anticipate that's gonna be a very late summer with the goal of having it completed prior to new board members being seated in January. And then um, <coughs> there's gonna be a number of policy revisions given legislative work. And I listened in on a legislative update with MSBA and I understand that Terry Morrow, Dr. Terry Morrow at MSBA is working on those policy revisions right now and anticipates them early in June. So the policy committee in their free time, of which they apparently have none, um, I think we can anticipate an MSBA guidance document and at least some statutorily required policy amendments. So that's the work at hand. Um, in a general timeline short and slightly further out. Does anybody, excuse me, does anybody have any other items that they're aware of or on the horizon? Um, I'm gonna just start at the end of the table just for, I'm all about going in order now. Director Dressley. June 1st, MSBA is having the legislative wrap up at meeting and I, I have that on my calendar to go to that. So I'll be, I'll be attending that by Zoom. I, I wanna say it's 9 a.m. but I can't remember for sure. Okay. I have it written here, yep. but I don't have a time yep. But I think that'll be a good opportunity to figure, to have a little bit better knowledge on what's going to hit us with in terms of policy. Yeah. So it's 1 p.m. Oh, so, yeah. so it will be recorded for people who can't attend. So. Yeah. So I think the answer is your living room yeah. is where it's going to be or kitchen table, whatever that is. Um, yep, so that's on the first, thank you. I'm glad you're attending. I will probably be in a position of listening to it on re recording. Director. Uh, I'm just wondering if board members need to be aware of anything with the graduation coming up here. Oh. You wanna give us a couple upcoming oh, board topics? No. Yeah. Yeah. What else? So Three of us don't care anymore. We're like, whatever, <laughs> moving on. So the, the typical uh, piece with the graduation will probably come out next week. Uh, the high school, I was at their staff meeting today. They've just uh, shared with staff who's responsible for what station during graduation. So they've got all that figured out. I anticipate that uh, Mr. Dorn will be uh, sharing something with all of us here in the next week as far as what to do, where to go, who's doing what, and, and what's needed for everybody in terms of participation. Thank you. Everybody yeah. keep fingers and toes crossed for good weather, right? Yeah, and just in general, the dates, so with 
the second being the last day of seniors in school, that's when we, board members, if they want to have helped with the, the lunch that day and keep your fingers crossed for good weather that day, that's way more fun if they can go outside too. And then the graduation <coughs> is the evening of the ninth. Just to make sure we have that on our calendars in general with more details to come forward. And then to expand on that, I know that the all night graduation party would love nothing more than to have seven more volunteers to get through that night. Whatever that looks up, like set up, doing the night, doing the cleanup, whatever that looks like. Um, and I think they have a sign up genius. I found it in the past on Facebook. So I'm saying that for the people at the table and people that are listening, fun night, good energy. Um, great way for the community to be involved in celebrating the, our recent graduates. Director Davis. Just for clarity's sake, um, for the community on the um, levy conversation, which will have public comment, um, are there restrictions in terms of number of people, time, that type of thing? Just so everybody knows. Yeah, so we'll use the same guidelines that we just recently adopted in 206. There will not be a limitation on number of people, but we'll probably use that same three minute um, period of speaking and we'll use a timekeeper. But we will, we will make ourselves available for um, any member of the public that wishes to speak in that um, time frame. And that will be again on June 14th and it will take the place of the work session. And I anticipate that we'll use the media center here in, um, cause we, I think we have a quite a good amount of seating and then following the public comment, um, will be board deliberations and, and action uh, up or down. So I, I don't want to presuppose anybody, but certainly again, the administrative recommendation is to, is to secure funds that we can secure, um, when we can secure them. So, uh, director Zuzik, did you have anything? that you're aware of on the horizon? No, thank you. Director Dressley. Tomorrow there are some of us board members that are going to um, listen to the advocate presentations at the high school, just so everybody's aware of that. They're, yep, yep. <laughs> just so everybody was aware that there are some of us that are will be in the high school tomorrow doing that. All right, hearing nothing additional for future meetings, I would entertain a motion and a second to adjourn. So move Davis. Second, Tate. Motion Davis, second, Tate. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. We are adjourned at 7.52. Sun is still. And Dairy Queen is still open. <laughs>